So today I want to talk to you about one of the most important controls in the world of magic, the overhand shuffle control. It's the first control many of us learn, and everyone's in such a hurry to get uh, over it and learn something more difficult. They miss the fact that the overhand shuffle in most situations is simply the most natural, unsuspicious, and uh, de uh, deceptive uh, control that it's really possible to learn. Now, in order to do a good overhand shuffle, you have to know how to both shuffle the cards and run the cards singly. That means one at a time off the pack. Now, most of the time, people just shuffle like so. That's how your grandma shuffles. But it's not terribly deceptive, and it's not very adaptable. So if you were regularly shuffling like your grandma, just dropping cards off the pack like that, and then you occasionally needed to run five cards singly, it would be very, very unnatural, very suspicious. And now, of course, you're raising suspicion in the mind of your audience at the exact moment when you're doing something sneaky. So a finished overhand shuffle will literally, your regular overhand shuffle, to be uniform with that, will always, eventually, be a combination of running some cards and shuffling off some clumps. Running and shuffling off clumps. Alternating. That's how you do it normally when you're actually doing everyday shuffling, as opposed to just letting the cards go in packets. Like a person who doesn't do magic at all, you want to readapt so that you can alternate. Now here's the thing. Most of my students come to me not really terribly conversant with the overhand shuffle, and that's because they haven't learned how to confidently run the cards. That's the part that'll really, you know, foul you up. You have to know how to run the cards singly, as many as you need to, every single time, without ever missing or without ever feeling like you took two or three and you're not exactly sure what happened. Now, in real life, you'll never really need to do this, likely, more than 10 to 20 cards in the course of a trick, and that's if you're really hardcore and making yourself a bit of a, a, a master of it. But in order to learn how to do it in the first place, it's good to run the exercise of drilling running the cards. That means learning to run the cards one at a time through the entire deck, like so. And I suggest when you practice, you really go at it and learn to run the entire deck of cards while you're looking somewhere, talking, enjoying your evening. You should be able to count 52 cards off without missing any of them, one at a time. Now that's a little bit harder than it looks, especially because the overhand shuffle should be one of the first things that you really learn to tackle before you start dealing with all kinds of crazy moves that you may learn other places. So I had a student last week named Mike from New Zealand, and he's been learning how to run the cards. And he was having some trouble because when we learned he was using bicycles, and when he, we were practicing, he was using these Fourniers, these 605 Fourniers. Now, I love these 605 Fourniers. Fourniers. They're strong. They're, they, they can take a licking and keep on ticking. You can palm a card for two to three minutes, put it back in the deck, and it never looks like you've bent anything or nothing's out of order. But these cards are unforgiving. And if you haven't learned exactly how to monitor the pressure that you're applying to them, you may start feeling, like my friend Mike did, that it, they're making things more difficult. They're not making things more difficult, but what they are doing is forcing you to learn about the pressure you're applying to cards and, and what it really takes to get the job done. So that way, when you're not just using a deck of brand new bicycles, but you're using someone's house deck or poker deck or beer stain deck, you can learn how to adjust your pressure so that you can always get exactly the run that you want to get. So I just want to give you today a few different tips to help you learn to run the card successfully and confidently. And maybe you haven't thought about a few of these, but you can alter these different concepts to help you get a nice, consistent, confident run no matter what deck of cards that you're using. So here are the touches. Assuming that you start with the deck in your natural position, bring the cards to an overhand position. Notice that that's 45 degree angle. It's really important that when you take the cards, with your right hand, the deck is at a 45 degree angle. Notice it's not parallel to the palm or horizontal like this. It's 45 degrees, just like a dealing shoe in Las Vegas. And remember, a dealing shoe only serves one purpose, allowing the dealer to run cards off singly. So now, 
assuming the cards are at a 45 degree position, your thumb and second finger hold the cards evenly right across. Now the more trouble you're having, the higher up on the cards you can hold them. Notice that if I'm having a really difficult time, I'm almost off the deck. My thumb and second finger are only half holding the topmost card. Normally you'll be right down here, but if you're having a hard time, bring it right up there. What that does is it means that you're literally holding the cards with less fingers and there's less grip that the left thumb has to clear as it's pulling the cards off the pack. Now, the third thing you want to look at is the bevel, which is controlled by the right first finger. If you're having a hard time running the cards, increase that bevel just a little bit. And now what you're actually doing is you're sort of making sure that you hold each card with a cross section of your thumb and second finger. So now you can literally adjust the pressure as needed so that even if someone gives you not just a high quality European deck that you're unused to, but a beer stained, waterlogged, dog-eared deck, you can still run the card successfully.